All right, so our next presentation comes from the Mars Society archivist, uh, Frank Crossman, and he's going to talk about the agriculture for an early Mars settlement. Take it away. Thank you very much. I guess if I had to sum up what this talk is going to be about, it's Mars needs farmers. We haven't mentioned that at all today. Uh, why would you want to listen to a systems designer, Bruce McKenzie, uh, material science, uh, PhD, opine about agriculture on Mars? Well, I guess one thing we could say is we both have about 20 years each in the Mars Society. Bruce is on the steering committee. I'm the chief, chief archivist. I gather your papers and your presentations and put them online. And we're both very passionate about the self-sustained and permanent human settlement of Mars, more so than the, the uh, just getting there and exploring it. It's very important to us. In the 2000s, uh, we both contributed to a series of studies on bootstrapping of a critical mass of industrial equipment from Earth that would enable an industrial civilization on Mars. We were both involved also in the Marspedia project, and that's how we kind of got started just asking ourselves, what's next in the way of uh, studies that the Mars Society, the Mars Foundation, in the case of the organization that Bruce heads up, what could we do? And, and we both realized in looking at the Marspedia state of the art that there's very little that's been described regarding how to actually do a successful agriculture on Mars. So we're looking to basically try to define the allowance of self-sustained growing of food for Mars settlers and, and do that in a way that encompasses all of the disciplines that might have something to say about it. So our, our, our premise here basically is to guarantee sustainable food sources for a permanent settlement. We're we clearly cannot rely upon Earth to help us with food deficit at some point. So we're, we're predicating that we have upwards of 100 to 200 permanent settlers. Uh, and we're also thinking that there's got to be a pretty long lead time for testing agricultural methods with multiple crops and crop cycles in a pressure lower than that on Earth. And may, one of the important things right now is we've got to convert that poisonous regolith, which has all these perchlorates in it, to a fertile soil. So the concern here is that these agricultural studies may be the long pole in the tent in comparison to all of the effort that most of us engineers have put in on the hardware, the, the rocketry, et cetera. So what I'll do in the presentation is review some relevant prior studies, identify some key issues, and what we're proposing is a systematic study of all aspects of sustained agriculture uh, for an early Mars settlement of a few hundred people. And that's going to require contributions from a number of experts. I've only listed a few here on this slide. Here's your eye test. I'm, I'm not really going to uh, use the slide anything more than just to say we have uh, documented all of the references related to these prior studies. Uh, they're available at the end of the presentation. The presentation has already been published on Mars uh, papers. Uh, you can go there and click on those references and go right di directly to the original work. So if I go back in time, I, I could go to the 70s when O'Neill and Heppenheimer uh, were looking at agriculture on very large space colonies. Essentially, they had Earth atmosphere. They had 20-mile-long uh, areas to grow. Uh, they were really just translating Earth agriculture to a very large space colony. 
But that's very different than what we deal with on Mars. Uh, in the 80s, uh, NASA was actually serious about going and, and establishing a, a base on the moon, and Tibbetts and others uh, did quite a bit of work in conditioning the moon regolith into soil that could be used for growing crops. But again, just plans. Uh, in, in 2004 and, and for several years thereafter, Hublitz, Bucklin, and Hanford all had studies NASA supported that looked at uh, various concepts for greenhouses, uh, different levels of pressure in which you could grow uh, plants, and um, Hublitz in, in particular was concerned about the, the convection uh, being different on Mars uh, and, and how that affects the, the temperature range in the greenhouses. Uh, Mackenzie, as, as I mentioned on the earlier slide, had started this homestead project and uh, a number of us had contributed to that. But one of the things he, he actually came up with was the concept of a, a cylindrical greenhouse that, w that had a regolith cover on top. And he used mirrors and concentrators to bounce the Martian sunlight into the greenhouse. In preparing this talk, I found this study that I'd never heard of. It, it's a, a Yamashita and, and colleagues in Japan had come up with a space agriculture task force. And, and, and it was a really fine, detailed study. Uh, it looked at crop and animal species evaluation, selection, conversion of the regolith uh, to soil, and uh, fertilization methods, and even got into some of the closed loop control things of a potassium sodium cycle uh, in, in which plants are a lot more susceptible to uh, sodium than we are. Uh, then in the 2012 time frame, we had uh, Binstead and Hunter do a number of uh, studies at the analog uh, Mars stations, FMARS, MDRS, high seas and they were looking at the importance of food variety on crew factors. Crew factors meaning, in this case, the psychology. How, how does the team work uh, in combination with plants that they are using to pre prepare food or uh, in the case of uh, NASA rations, they're just eating them without much preparation at all. Uh, in 2013, uh, Davila, McKay and others at NASA Ames began to look at this, this perchlorate problem. And they did propose a enzymatic removal of perchlorate and actually converting it to oxygen. Uh, but again, that was a study that uh, proposed something, but as far as I'm aware of, there have been no experiments to actually take it through. Uh, last year, uh, Morgan Irons made a presentation on uh, growing a number of crop varieties on Mars, and she, she used the term competitive redundancy as an important one where you're, you're basically allowing a number of crops to uh, take their place uh, on Mars. Which ones of these are gonna be the most radiation sensitive? We don't know, really know yet, but the idea is there'll be some that will do better than others. Uh, Sean Moss in Australia is writing a book on agriculture on Mars, but he's not done yet. So all we have from him are some blogs that he has online, and he talks a lot about the, the diet, uh, the choice of diets. Maybe, maybe it's even a phasing in of diets. You start with vegan, you go to pesca vegan with some fish, and maybe eventually then to the omnivore diet that I certainly would subscribe to. So I'll try to focus here on a number of uh, issues. One of them, the, the number one, I think, is the stability of agricultural systems. Uh, we, we know that we're going to have to have uh, some reservoirs for the oxygen, the nitrogen, the argon, and the water um, in the event that our processing systems break down. Well, that's also true of food. We need food storage systems, and we don't even know for how long 
because, you know, I'm not an expert on what could go wrong with the processing or the growing, but we need experts who, who can actually kind of identify what that reservoir is necessary for in, in food. Uh, plant variety and growing area distribution is another uh, element of this. Uh, some plants grow better than others uh, under the, the conditions of uh, radiation and, and sunlight on Mars. Uh, that would be the competitive redundancy that Irons described. Some plants could be modified for Mars. That would require genetic engineering. And some plants will want wetter, drier, hotter, cooler conditions. Uh, they're going to be diverse greenhouse growing conditions. So multiple greenhouses rather than just talking about a single greenhouse. Well, here's our perchlorate molecule. Um, and this is the, the item that uh, I worry quite a bit about. It, it's uh, regolith processing for agricultural use. You have to remove the perchlorate. Why is that? Well, 25 parts per billion of perchlorate can lead to uh, hypothyroid condition. It basically replaces the uh, ability for the body to pick up iodine or iodide. Uh, and that's, okay, 25 parts per billion. We have 1% perchlorate in the soil. That's a ratio of 400,000 above the medically safe level. That's a real concern. Uh, the Mars simulant soil that's sold by a couple of commercial companies right now is not sold with perchlorate in it. They can't deal with the liability. It's too dangerous. But, but certainly there are, there are other uh, heavy metals that exist in the regolith that has to, have to be uh, cleaned out as well. Uh, Zubrin back in 2008 suggested that a lot of this could be done with leaching out with, by water. Uh, but uh, if you look at the catalyzed reaction that Davila is suggesting, it can be done at a much lower temperature using enzymes or catalysts, and it should be pursued. <coughs> the next critical step, I think, is converting that processed regolith into really fertile soil. Uh, there have been some studies of growing in the simulant uh, Irons had done some of this last year. Uh, but we need to go beyond that regolith and convert it by adding a lot of organic product to it uh, to get something that looks as, as nice as the guy holding uh, a plant in his hands. So, so the most comprehensive study is the Yamashita Task Force. Uh, he looked at, uh, uh, this task force looked at a number of uh, fertilizing uh, elements that are important for plant growth, uh, not just the, the ones we're familiar with in our back garden of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And uh, that in included a, a study and plan for composting with bacteria, fungi, <coughs> insects, and worms. I'll give you an example. Uh, some, some of you probably live here in California like I do. And we have a state rock. It's serpentine. Uh, those of you who don't live here probably wonder what that is. But it's an ultramafic rock that uh, is, is there on the surface because it's been raised up from the subduction zone that took place along the coast of California millions of years ago. That particular rock weathers and breaks down, but it has a low calcium to magnesium ratio. It's lacking in the NPKs, uh, it's high in uh, heavy metals, iron, cobalt, nickel, and chrome. And, and European grasses, which spread all over California, brought here by the, the Spanish, uh, they don't do very well in the soil. But what's interesting is every spring there are millions and millions of endemic wildflowers that have actually been able to uh, modify themselves over who knows how many years, to, to actually uh, grow only in those soils. They've, they've been, in essence, gotten used to some of these heavy metals and, and can thrive uh, just as well as anything else. And I, I think that that's 
the issue that uh, Irons was getting at, namely that you had to have a, w a way to determine how competitive certain uh, plants will be under the environment that they're going to experience. The Yamashita Task Force study was looking at uh, growing a, uh, a fairly small list of plants. And so they did an analysis of a uh, number of crops you could get from a particular plant over the course of a year. It looked at the kilocalories that you could uh, expect to get uh, over that uh, year period, and also the uh, daily protein requirements uh, across that. Um, they chose rice, soybean, and sweet potato as the primary crops. But they also included things like mulberry trees and silkworms, and even suggested that the silkworm pupa could be eaten as high protein food. And that the, uh, the as I said, I was very impressed with their study, but, but uh, it doesn't, I mean, it sounded strange to me. Uh, and, and, and then I realized that culture, choices are not always based on data. They're based on cultural biases. And uh, if you look at this chart, this is a radar chart of all of those crops that they had proposed to use in, in the, the uh, Yamashita study. Uh, the uh, red arrow, the, the red line basically shows the square footage or square meters required to grow a yearly quantity of uh, crop that meets the daily protein needs, and the blue, uh, the same for uh, kilocalories, or calories as we call them in, in the food side. Uh, so what's good on this chart? What's good on this chart is basically uh, those things that are close to the origin of the, the radar chart. And that would be potato, not sweet potato, or rice. And um, that was why there was a problem in Ireland, because they relied on this one particular crop. They tripled the population in 150 years once potatoes were introduced. And with the blight, uh, they, they lost over 50%, 60% of the population. So a little bit of audience participation time. If you had moved permanently to Mars and had a limited diet, uh, what food would you miss most? <laughs> anybody, anybody want to throw out? Milk products. Ice cream. Ice cream. Ice cream. Martinis? <laughs> How about chocolate? <laughs> All right. oh. uh, Bruce, our, our, my co-author here, s said he had to start a gluten-free diet about 10 years ago, and he missed plain crackers more than he missed pizza. Here's my list. <laughs> and and uh, I'll just, I put kimchi up here because, yeah, it's surprising. It's uh, sauerkraut on steroids with lots of spices, but it does make my mouth water just thinking about eating it. <laughs> and there was a, there was a uh, Korean astronaut who went up to the space station and asked to bring some kimchi. So that, that actually was accomplished. But so, 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 you know, t t viewing this from my point of view, if Mars is limited to pesca vegan agriculture at first, can I have everything else on this chart uh, either uh, directly or substituted with something else? So I asked myself, can that be done? And the answer is yes. I'm going to introduce you here on this chart to the Impossible Burger and Beyond Burger. Uh, Impossible Burger is sold in restaurants here in Pasadena, Beyond Burger at any Safeway. And they ha these are plant-based products that uh, basically match the nutritional value of 80-20 hamburger. OK. 
In order to make a cheeseburger, I need some cheese. Uh, this is the, the uh, non-dairy evolution cookbook version of Swiss cheese. Looks quite good. I need to do the same in substitutions uh, for milk and eggs, and that can be done with things like cashew, with soybean, etc. And I give you the cheeseburger in paradise, or on Mars in this case. The uh, charts that I was just showing and playing around with basically relate to agricultural choices, a mix of crops, uh, the phasing of crops over a period of years, and, and maybe more importantly with regards to plant substitutes, the cost of the processing equipment versus just raising some chickens. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, Bruce has, has uh, contributed here primarily the idea that there, there are several different crop types. One might be a field crop like wheat that is basically planted and you forget about it until you have to go back and harvest it. Uh, there will be other areas that, will, that he called tended gardens, and this would be like a tomato plant that uh, you'll visit more frequently while the, the tomatoes are ripening, but otherwise uh, it doesn't have to be something you see every day. And then there will be the daily harvest salad greenhouse that will be close by to the kitchen and dining areas. And I've added the uh, fruit and nut trees because uh, a lot of the uh, dairy substitutes come from cashews and almonds. And uh, we don't want to forget about that. I think the trees would actually be very uh, important in terms of crew factors, just feeling like uh, it's a nice environment to be in. There have been a lot of concepts in the past. Uh, Bruce came up with one that he called the air mattress uh, inflatable uh, greenhouse. Uh, but what we're going to propose here basically is to review a lot of this in our task force. I kind of hit around on a number of these optimum growing conditions vary with crop. And uh, that also includes trade-offs you might have between using LEDs versus sunlight. One is very energy intensive. So here's the project that we have in mind. Uh, the timeline uh, is listed here. It would involve a kickoff meeting that Mars Foundation supports. Uh, it would include internships. And what we promise to do is to report back out at the next Mars Society convention as to progress. Uh, the signups uh, can be done online at the Mars Foundation website, as indicated in this chart, uh, or you can, you can uh, email uh, to info at Mars Foundation. Here's the list of relevant disciplines. A little scary. Uh, re regolith processing, chemistry, geology, bacteriology, soil amendments using entomology, insects, and mycology, fungi, and mushrooms. And I could go down the list. Uh, I'll mention under food growing animal husbandry. It needs a new name. <laughs> yeah. And we, we are also looking for volunteers in the critical support areas, uh, basically to get the project going and, and provide the publicity for it. So, if you haven't learned anything new today, uh, I want you to know that Mars is also the Roman god of agriculture. I never knew that before until I started looking into this. Uh, as, as, my, as I mentioned, the uh, paper is already online at marspapers.org, and uh, you can contact uh, Bruce through the Mars Foundation uh, if you have some interest in this. I have a sign-up sheet that I'll I have, when I head outside, uh, if any of you want to sign up for more information, or if you have recommendations on experts that could contribute to this kind of study, we'd love to be uh, you know, making a list of these people because it's such a huge list to deal with. Um, I'll just, 
here's, here's my eye chart. This is the set of references. All the blue there are direct links, so you can um, find out more about these topics uh, than I had time to do in 25 minutes. So uh, with that, I'll stop, and thank you very much. I did look at that. There's a fantastic uh, video by a company that has, has produced in vitro chicken. And they started with a feather of a chicken and uh, converted that to chicken nuggets. And, and one of the scenes at the end is they're sitting around a picnic table and the, and the uh, chicken is wandering around at their feet and uh, they're eating their chicken nuggets from the, that chicken. Um, not much. I, th I think that, that uh, one of the issues there is, is it possible to grow some crops out in the open, if I can call it that, versus under regolith? And, and I don't have an answer for that. Um, I don't think there's been, a, there's been enough in the way of uh, experimental studies. There's starting to be some thinking about how to grow a red hard radish. Using uh, genetic uh, manipulation uh, to give the radish uh, better ability to uh, repair damage. And, and radishes have such a short growing season to begin with that that actually helps you. Yeah. It's it's less radiation sensitive right, right from the start. Yeah. yeah. We get time for one more question. Okay. We'll take your victim. Jim. Rather do it on plants. Could be. I'd, I'd rather work on the plants myself. Something farther removed from. I just want to end on Mars needs farmers, and we need farmers to do some experiments. Yeah. So think about it. <laughs>